1705, Pierre de Silva de Portuguese is appointed by the governor of New France as royal courier between Quebec and Montreal. He also carries mail for ordinary citizens. Love letters, summonses, bills, letters to cachet, and so forth. Pierre is Canada's first postman. takes so long for goods to travel between Quebec and Montreal. The explanation is simple. There is no road. There were no roads anywhere in those days. The settlers were isolated from home by brooding forests and unnecessary quantities of rivers and lakes. They could never be sure they'd ever hear from the old country again. by sea was to put it into the hands of the gods, as the sea and the sailing ships were rarely on friendly terms. Oh my God, I wish I were home. in the New World, the mail was delivered to a well-known coffee house by the ship's captain, in person. The citizens were only too pleased to compensate the captain for his trouble. No mail? You could always read somebody else's. Some letters wouldn't be read at all if the owners didn't show up in time. They might get lost or stolen or suffer some other fate. So even if you lived near the ports, delivery wasn't guaranteed. But in the backwoods, the message was direct and to the point. <gasps> oh, dear. The appointment of royal couriers improved communications along the St. Lawrence River. Dry land. Well, that was a different matter. So to the governor of New France, the soldiers, merchants, and plain citizens took their gripes. He agreed to build a road between Quebec and Montreal. Post houses were set up to provide relief for tuckered out travelers and tired horses. The new road made it possible for citizens to travel and live in something like peaceful old French style. Dum, 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 dum. Except by now, the peaceful old French were battling the friendly old English again. Wolfe ended this conflict at Quebec, and New France wandered into the British Empire, almost by accident. When news arrived that peace had been signed in Paris, a deputy postmaster promptly flew up from Philadelphia to set up a general post office in Quebec. Mr. Benjamin Franklin by name. Ben established new post offices in Quebec, Three Rivers, and Montreal under a buoyant Scot named Hugh Finlay. Finlay put the post houses on the Quebec-Montreal road to good use in speeding the mails. And his couriers were given priority all along the route. 
why even the ferrymen were ordered to take the couriers across toll-free, of course. Improved communications had a stimulating effect on trade and commerce between French Canada and the other British colonies in North America. The canoes that came swishing down the natural waterways from New York brought hot news from the outside world. It was only a few weeks old. Then came 1775. Domingos Bontempo was born. Domingos Bontempo? Uh, Sarah Siddons made her debut on the London stage. There was also a little spot of trouble in the colonies that year. The Americans declared their independence. A good many thousand Americans, however, remained loyal to the British crown and were forced to cross into Canada. The revolution was also highly inconvenient mail-wise. The mail now had to be collected from Halifax instead of New York. In those days, it was the addressee who paid the postage. The postal official x-rayed the mail, and if there were two sheets of paper inside, it cost twice as much. Even by the year 1800, letters still came by ship to Toronto. Renamed York, uh, later renamed Toronto. Land communication gradually improved. It started with a courier trudging all the way from Montreal to Niagara, once a year. Only ten years later, there was a service every two weeks between Kingston and York, uh, later renamed Toronto. And as clean, wholesome immigrants poured into the country, the mail service dove with them even deeper into the unknown. In 1812, the Americans decided to see Canada, but not as immigrants or tourists. To encourage Canadians to free themselves from the yoke of British imperialism, they burned all the post offices on the Niagara Peninsula. of fighting during which the ineptitude of one side was nicely balanced with the incompetence of the other, they went home and peace broke out again. This gave communications a chance to improve still further. New towns, new roads were built, even a new bridge or two. Steamboats made their appearance on Lake Ontario, complete with smokestacks and mailboxes. However, most people still left their letters in the captain's cabin. The official rates were so steep that hardly anyone could afford them. For this small, unofficial service, the captain charged a small, unofficial fee. Ahem. Trouble was, the post office, like everything else, was still being run from London. A reform movement sprang up. Its loudest spokesman was Mr. William Lyon Mackenzie. Among a good many other institutions, he denounced the Postal Service. It was illegal, a monopoly. It oughtn't to be allowed. And worst of all, the profits all went to England. The reformers passed a law for a provincial post office. The executive passed it back. They'd been passing for years. This got on the reformers' nerves, and in 1837, they rebelled in Montreal and in Toronto, where Mackenzie made his headquarters in a well-known uh, refreshment establishment, which may or may not have been the reason the rebellion failed. Afterward, 
the government which had brought little energy to running the country showed plenty in looking for culprits. Culprits were everywhere, from the lowest quill pusher to Toronto's illustrious postmaster. Get out! Get out! The rebellion was by no means a washout, however. For by the time its sores had healed, it had become obvious that colonial rule was going out of fashion. Responsible government was becoming visible through the smoke of the Industrial Revolution. The building of the La Prairie to St. John's Quebec Railway in 1836 was one of the manifestations of this revitalized age. rush of railway building throughout eastern Canada followed. The post office was quick to take advantage of this newfangled means of communication. The West, though, was still isolated. Apart from the occasional dog team, there was little contact between East and West. And then, Gold, 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 gold! Yes, in 1858, gold was discovered on the Fraser River. Thousands joined the gold rush. Including the post office, whose most colorful agent in the West, Bernard's Express, galloped with the mails to the remotest parts of the gold fields. With all that gold and all those miners, British Columbia looked like a Friday night rush hour. But all too soon, the dust and the nuggets were panned out, and British Columbia was left highly uncertain about its future. Stay with the rest of Canada? Hmm. Join the United States? They decided to stay, on the condition that rail and postal services would link them with the rest of the country. They got the mail service, though for a long time it was courtesy of the steamers from San Francisco. Finally, in 1885, after great hardship and crippling opposition from the less imaginative, Donald Smith of the Canadian Pacific drove the la, uh, 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 bent the, bent, bent the last, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> finally drove the last spike. The mail service and the country were united at last. Changing and growing together through the Victorian era. When aircraft became reliable, mailbags started flying around at dizzy speeds of over a hundred miles an hour. Why, by the Second World War, they were fairly clipping along. And when rockets become standard transportation, the mail is sure to be aboard. Fifty years after Pierre de Silva de Portugues, the business letters, the love letters, the newsletters, the summonses are still being delivered to you and I with the same personalized service that Canada's first mailman started so long ago. Mm -hmm.